Okay, um, so we'll continue now. Um, so as one of the students asked earlier, these sort of split bars in between. Um, so when you make, I mean, has everyone heard of a histogram before? Or has anyone not heard of a histogram? So when you make a histogram, you always have to make bins. And so there's some sort of discretization that happens where you say, I want 50, 100, 10, whatever the number might be, bins to represent the range between 0 and 1, or 0 and whatever you're looking at in the data. And so when you make these bins, you sort of decide on fixed intervals to classify pixels. So if we go back to one of the you know, example here, each bin is maybe 0.1 wide. And so you have 15 bins to go between 0 and 1.5. And so what you do is for the count the pixels in it, you find all of the pixel values that sort of are between 0.75 and 0.8, or 0.7 and 0.8, and that all then gets put into this bin. When we defined a threshold value, if it's on one of the edges or borders of this bin, it's fine, because that means that this bin is then entirely above and this one's entirely below. If we define a threshold where that's not the case, then we end up with sort of these half bins where you know, half of what is in this bin is below and the other half is above, and so that bin now has two colors. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's arbitrarily being decided. The rule is still exactly the same. It's just when you make a histogram, you have to be aware that those, that binning and how you do this will affect how you perceive the data. Um, and so when you're looking at different data sets, that is important that you choose a binning that makes sense and that's not always completely obvious or trivial to pick. But you know, if you look at your data and you see that it doesn't form two groups, that doesn't necessarily mean there aren't two groups. That just might mean that the way you've chosen to discretize your data makes it look very bad or doesn't let you see the sort of trends that are inside of it because you know, the bins are too wide or too small. Um, you'll also notice, not in this case, but very frequently when you make bins, you'll end up with sort of a zigzag pattern, or you'll have kind of a, it looks like spikes on your curve, where, you know, every other bin is twice as high as the bin before. And what that tends to mean is that the bins you're creating don't match up with the things that your detector is measuring very well. And so if you look at, you know, a detector that's 8-bit, it can record values between 0 and 255. And if your bins are 2.5 in width, that means every other bin will cover 3 pixels instead of 2 pixels. So some of the bins only have 2 pixels in them. Some of the, pixel, the bins will have 3. So if your bin width is 2.5, you'll have 0, 1, and you know 1 and a half, which doesn't count as anything because you don't have any half value in one bin, and the next bin will have one, two, three in the same bin. And so some of them will have many more elements than other ones. And so you have to be sort of aware that that bin size isn't completely arbitrary and needs to be adapted to whatever data set that you're looking at. In practice, what this means is that you should just create a couple of different histograms and try adjusting the settings to make sure you're getting an accurate representation of what your data is and not just let the automatic histogram creation function make something for you because that might not be exactly what you're interested in. It's also important, which we've covered here well, that when you're comparing images that you use the same set of bins when you make the histogram. So if you make a histogram with different sets of bins and then you try to compare those two histograms, it will be very difficult to establish if <coughs> something has changed or not. And so it's important that you may do that consistently. But anyways, um, so to kind of move beyond that, as we mentioned at the very beginning, the thresholding step itself always results in the same final values for the data. And so even if you start off with something like a vector field, so if you had some kind of sensor that measures magnetic field orientation and intensity, you might end up with some map like this, that when you apply a threshold to it, you get a black and white image out. 
So even though you have a vector image here, the result from this is black and white. What changes is, of course, the rule you have to apply. And so in one dimension, we had this histogram. And to apply a threshold, you just drop a line somewhere. In 2D, we now have a two-dimensional histogram. And we have to drop two lines in order to sort of bring that into two different groups. And so it means we have to kind of pick a line on this you know, x-axis and pick a line on the y-axis that allows us to classify it into two different groups. And so if you see here, if you say, I want to keep everything sort of um, in this upper corner, you have some rule like that, and you apply it to the image, and you get your sort of color image out based on the orientation values rather than just the intensity. You know, you can also apply other kind of more complicated thresholds where you look at, you know, dot products or whatever that might be. But the idea remains the same, that as your image data gets more and more complicated, this rule might get more complicated or might involve more different features. But the result is exactly the same, that you're trying to separate it into two different classes. And so here we can, you know, tune the acceptance of what we're doing, and so you get images that look like that because you're focused on the orientation, or you could focus on the length, or you could do a number of other different things, but the result is ultimately the same. So now this is where we get to sort of the more interesting aspect, and this is the machine learning approach to image processing. And so everything we've covered up until now has really been this experimentalist approach. And it's how um, most research groups or most imaging groups have worked for a long time. And this machine learning approach is really how you can start to deal with these problems in a more quantitative way and have very clear criteria for assessing the quality of your segmentation without sort of saying, yeah, it looks like it classifies this part better or it looks like you know it's counting too many of the pixels at the border or it's too sensitive to noise, that you can now come up with sort of things that are um, easily defined and are well suited to the task that you're trying to do. Um, this is also where all of the contest ideas come in. And so what we have here is, you know, starting off with this image, you can look at this, and if you look hard enough, you can see that there's sort of a ring structure inside there, and that's what you're trying to identify. So your measurement, you know, has lots of noise, your resolution of your detector isn't great, there's any number of factors that are causing this to not look ideal, but you know there's supposed to be a ring inside. And so this idea of ground truth is ideally coming from other measurements or more accurate measurements, but can also be coming from people and people's assessment of something. And this is where you say, I know in this image that this is what I'm interested in, this ring, and that's you know colored in blue, and this is what I'm not interested in, and this is you know sort of the background. And so we call this ring foreground and this background. And what we want to do is now assess how well different approaches are able to find that ring that we're looking for in the image. And so, you know, you want to classify the pixels in the ring as foreground and the pixels outside of the ring as background. And so now we come up with this idea of sort of true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. And so anyone who's had sort of a statistics class has heard of these terms before. And this can be applied to images the same way it can be applied to all sorts of other data sets. And so what we have here is that, you know, here we take kind of an arbitrary threshold. So we say kind of anything that's above, you know, we, the ring is brighter than the background. And so let's keep everything above 200, for example. And so we end up with a segmentation that looks like that. And so this is the result or the output of our algorithm, so this simple threshold. And what we want to do now is see 
how well did this algorithm actually do? And so this is where we visualize what are the false negatives, what are the false positives, what are the true negatives, and what are the true positives. And so we have kind of two things. We have what is our ground truth as background and foreground, and we have what did our algorithm spit out as background and foreground. And so we put them in these four different categories with true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. And what's nice with an image is that we can actually visualize this. So we can actually see where did the false positives occur, where did the you know, false negatives occur, where is our algorithm doing well, and where isn't it doing well. Whereas when you look at something you know, like cancer diagnosis, you know, a false positive is a number. There's not really anything you can easily look at to figure out what about this case it might have been doing wrong. Whereas this image, you can easily see these are the kinds of things it was focused on, and this is what it did well. So if we now look, okay, we take a bunch of different thresholds to try to figure out which threshold value is the best. So that's kind of the challenge that we had before with the cells, is where can you drop this line in order to separate between the foreground and the background, between the ring and not the ring. And so we see here that for a number of different threshold values, you know, if you start at a threshold value of zero, then you have a really high true positive rate, but a really high false positive rate. And so a threshold of zero basically says, you say everything is part of the ring, which means you match. You do find everything in the ring, but you find everything outside of the ring as well. And so if you're only goal is to find everything in the ring, then you can just take a threshold of zero and you're done. If you do kind of the opposite approach, you don't want any false positives at all, then you set the threshold to one, and your false positives is zero, but your true positives is also zero, so you haven't classified anything at all. And so these are kind of the two extremes. And all of the points in between are this sort of trade-off between true positives and um, or sort of yeah, true positives and false positives. And so we count all of these things and we come up with these different curves. So as you increase the threshold, how do these percentages change? And what that looks like. I mean, what we see here quite clearly is that you know, point two is a much better threshold than zero because we still get all the true positives, but we've dropped the false positives by 25. And so that's you know, a much better result than we had before. So clearly there's no reason to stick with zero because point two is already much better. But when then you look at point two and point four, you now have 10 more false negatives or nine more false negatives. And so you know, it does do better on the number of false positives that you have, but that comes at a cost. And so this is really about coming up with a way of saying what is that cost, how can we measure it, and what is our actual goal. And so what terms we come up with out of this is rather than just saying true positive and false positive, we come up with things like precision and recall, or sensitivity and specificity or true positive rate and false positive rate. And so basically what these two would do is they kind of normalize the values that we're looking at. And so you have on one axis this idea of precision, on the other axis this idea of recall. And so recall is sort of the number of true positives over true positive plus false negatives. And precision is the number of true positives over true positives plus false positives. And so kind of intuitively what these things tell you is you know, your sensitivity is if you're trying to detect something, how likely is it that you actually detect it? And precision would be then, of the things you've detected, how likely is it that the thing you've detected is actually correctly detected? And so they kind of originally came from sort of this receiver operating characteristic, which was used in World War II when you had radar images and you were you know, measuring all of these signals, and you're trying to figure out, is this an enemy plane or not? And so, obviously, if you say every spot that shows up on your radar is an enemy plane, then 
you will find every enemy plane, but you will have a lot of false alarms when something comes that isn't an enemy plane. On the other hand, if you say nothing's an enemy plane, you won't have any false alarms, but you'll have a lot of sort of, um, you won't be ever alerted that an enemy plane is coming. And so this curve lets you see where that trade-off is. And so what you have here is, um, if we look at our threshold, and we change that threshold between 0 0.3 and 1, we get a curve that goes between sort of finding everything and finding everything, uh, or find, only finding the correct things. And the ideal point is then up here. And so if you're here, you are finding everything correctly and every, you know that there's no false negatives and there's no false positives. And so that's where you want to be. And the closer you are to this point, the better generally your system is. But you'll never or very rarely actually be at this point. And so that's why you have these curves that let you visualize how accurately you're doing something. So in this case, Right, and that's very frequently the case. Um, that you'll come up with some complicated algorithm and you'll make this curve, and you know, you'll have a bunch of different parameters you can tune, and you know, where you are on this curve is very dependent on what you're trying to do. And so usually what you say, and that's what comes in sort of the next one, um, which shows it in, I think is it this one? Um, yeah, I'll talk about that in two slides, but, um, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So with the threshold, it tends to be that. I mean, that if we go back to these curves, we sort of have the easier to visualize. As you increase this threshold value, you move along this curve quite well. And so you get up to the top. When you're now looking at these recall and precision, they're calculated a little bit differently. And so you don't always have the corners pinned at one on both sides. And so you get slightly a different result, which is then very much dependent on your image data. So with a threshold, you'll sort of always have this monotonically increasing result that there's always a threshold you can pick so that you include everything, and there's always a threshold you can pick so that you include nothing. But when you start to move towards more complicated parameters or more different types of assessments, you won't have that clear monotonic trend. And that's where sort of these other ways of assessing this curve come in. Because here, there isn't really an optimum spot. I mean, what you can very clearly say is that this point is better than that point because this point is much closer than this. And so that lets you see some of that trade-off well, but in general, where on this curve should you be? Right. Yeah, you c could, yeah. I mean, uh, that very rarely happens with like threshold, but yeah. You could have, you know, a threshold value here of like 0.07634281115 or whatever that happens to be right here that you don't see because the values of thresholds that you take don't cover that. That usually doesn't happen. Um, and you wouldn't have something like that that then immediately came back down again because your threshold is sort of everything above this value. 
When your threshold gets more complicated, where you say, you know, everything above this that's less than that, and or greater than this, then you can start to get very weird curves that show up here. But when you just say we include everything above this value, you tend not to get those sort of spikes that come out. So one of the very helpful things you can do with this curve is if we go back to the image enhancement. So kind of independent of which point on this curve is the best one, what this can tell us is which filter works the best for the problem that we're trying to solve. And so if we're trying to find the ring in our image, we can then apply a normal, so we apply nothing, we have the image exactly as it was, a Gaussian filter and a median filter. And so this is then just applied with one image, with one um, you know, window width or whatever. And you can now make an ROC curve for all three of those images using the range of threshold values that make sense. So you use 0 to 1 for all of them. And what you quite clearly see is that you get different curves out. And so now based on these curves, you can say which filters are better than which other filters. And so which is the best filter for this image? Yeah. And we see that the Gaussian is sort of always above the median filter. And so there is no point on this curve, or almost no point on this curve, where it makes sense to use a median filter. And so you can say Gaussian is the best one to use, and you don't really have to waste any more time saying, is median potentially better or you know, which one does your boss like better, or which one looks prettier, or whatever, you have a very clear criteria of saying, okay, Gaussian's always above, Gaussian wins, we use Gaussian, it's done. And if we want to try to use a Gaussian window of 5, or 6, or 3, or what the sigma value is, you could just make curves for all of those, and use that as now a very clear criteria for deciding which filter is the best. Yeah? So, yeah, this doesn't show the filtered images. This just shows the threshold after the image has been filtered. Oh, is the threshold, like, those are the images coming after thresholding the filtered images? Exactly, yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, that's a little so bit confusing. The image of, like, the original. Exactly. You never, almost never filter a threshold image. There's a few rare cases when you do that for certain tasks, but in general, you never filter a threshold image. That you always filter before thresholding in order to enhance the features that you're looking at, and then you apply the threshold. And so, yeah, you can see the different results that you have here and where these curves lie. And so now you can sort of look at it on another axis where you have true positive rate and false positive rate. And what's nice about this representation is that it gives you, um, so it's sort of flipped. So depending on who you're talking to, they define ROC curves in different ways. And so some people use the recall and sensitivity, and other people use the true positive rate and false positive rate. The nice part about the true positive rate and false positive rate is that you get this line of random guess. And of course, depending on exactly what your image looks like, that line might be in a slightly different place. But it lets you see, is your filter actually doing better than just randomly assigning classes? And so it gives you kind of a, a very rough baseline for comparing what you're doing. Um, and yeah, the slope of that is the probability that something's in that class in the first place. Cool. Um, so this is more about kind of evaluating these models in different conferences which have nice presentations about how you can look at these different models and assess them well. And so I'd recommend if you're interested to look at those links and actually to go back here. One of the things that we assess for this, which I had mentioned, is the area under the curve. And so the question of kind of which point on this curve is the best it's very difficult to decide, you know, is this point better than this point? Can't really say. It depends on what you're trying to do. 
but you can use the area under the curve to say, is this approach giving you overall a better result than another approach? And so that's often abbreviated as AUC. And so if you use you know, the tools in Python or the tools in Nine, they call this the ROC AUC, which is kind of a lot of um, abbreviations, but it's the sort of receiver operating curve area under the curve. And so that then gives you one number that you can then try to optimize. And so rather than having a bunch of curves that you need to look at, you know, if you're trying to find exactly the best sigma value for your Gaussian filter, you might have 100 different sigma values that you try. And you can then just calculate the AUC for all of those values in order to determine which one gives you the best result. Obviously, all of this is based on how accurate your ground truth is. And so if your ground truth is not very accurate, then you know you will never, or it'll be very difficult to get an AUC that's very high. And if you get a very high AUC, it might not necessarily mean you're doing a good image analysis step, because the things you're trying to extract aren't really possible in the first place. But it's a starting point for sort of assessing these different models and figuring out what parameters make the most sense. And so what I think is very powerful about this is that it moves you away from just having, you know, these are filters, we tweak the parameters until it looks good, to this is our criteria that we're trying to optimize, and we can let a computer or a cluster of computers spend days trying to optimize this parameter rather than us manually tweaking it and looking at images. Because once you've looked at a couple hundred images, you forget what other ones looked like. You forget you know, what artifacts came up, what instabilities came up, or sort of other problems that you had. And with this, you just have a simple number. And so it's very easy to compare 10,000 simple numbers. You can just sort them, or take the very highest one, or something like that. It's also important to note that with an example like this, of course, this looks very nice. But Typically, you'll want to do this over a large number of images. That finding the best parameters for one image might not be the best parameters when you're dealing with a lot of different images. I mean, as we went over in the first and second lectures in detail, there are a lot of different factors which can come in and make it very difficult to segment images. And so you might have an image where you know, your curve looks like this. And that looks great because you're using some sort of you know, anisotropic diffusion filter that really enhances the features you're looking at. But when you try that with a slightly noisier image, the result is then completely useless. And so then you want to be able to say, well, if we're looking at more than one image and we want to have a reproducible experiment, this gives us the high AU highest AUC on one image, but the average AUC over 10 images is then much lower. And so we don't want to use that technique. So sort of the example of you know, finding the road. And so we have an image like this, and we want to be able to automatically find the street inside this image. And so we have a fairly simple task of sort of ground truth. It's very easy. This is the road. This is the foreground. That's the background. You know, applying a very simple threshold, saying everything above this is road, everything behind this is not road, gives us a pretty bad result. You know, you classify things not particularly accurately. You can then sort of start making these curves of as you increase the threshold value, how do these true positive, true negative, false positive, false positive change? And what does that curve actually look like? And so this curve now looks very weird in our image, so that there's points over here that, you know, are much, much, much lower than points over there. And so that's not usually how these curves look, but that's what it looks like for this particular data set. And that we can kind of see when we flip this over to true positive rate, false positive rate, there's actually a whole range here where we perform worse than just random guessing. And so it doesn't do a very good job. And there's points above there where it's somewhat better, but overall it's still very bad at identifying something like a road using a simple threshold. 
If we now start to use other pieces of information, um, you can add sort of additional criteria. So if you say, you know, just look at the lower half of the image or just focus on certain aspects of it, you can then start to get a much, much higher curve, and then you can compare the results that you get to the data that you had before. And so if you're looking at something like the area under the curve, you can see that this region blur area is much, much higher than the ones we had earlier. Um, yeah, so you can do this for a lot of different images. We'll leave that out at the moment. And so now we kind of have a task of segmenting shale. And this is a, an example from X-ray imaging where you have sort of these three different phases inside of it. And so this is now moving beyond just black and white or binary classification to classifying a number of different phases. And so here what we have is that there's very low absorbing things, which are then sort of air, so where it goes completely through. Medium absorbing things where it's clay. And then very high absorbing regions where it's rock or sort of heavily mineralized. So now we take it and we kind of make a histogram out of our data set. And we see that there's a pretty continuous distribution. So there seem to be a lot of things in this region, but there's not clearly any differentiation between a clay, a rock, and an air. It's just kind of one big spread. And so we can try to come up with rules for this, where we say that you know everything above 0.5 is rock, everything below 0.25 is air, or 0.2, whatever that criteria might be. Uh, but the problem is we have lots of kind of overlap and we have lots of regions that are in between. And if you have a boundary between something that's rock and something that's air, that's going to look like clay. Because if sort of half of your pixels are rock and half of them are air, and you average them out, then you'll have something in between, even though there isn't necessarily any clay between the rock and the air. And so you start to run into kind of challenges or issues when you look at data sets like that. Um, so we'll skip over this. That's just sort of more about the implementation. This is then a little bit more detail about this idea of partial volume effect, which is what we started um, on that last aspect, where if you are making a measurement of a continuous 3D structure or 2D structure, the borders of this structure are going to have values that are sort of intermediate between what you're actually, what's actually 100% in the object and what's 100% outside of the object. And so what we see here is as you change the radius, for example, of this object, the mean intensity and standard deviation changes. And so that these pixels on the border are very, very sensitive to what that radius is and how big your pixels are compared to how big the objects you're looking at are. And so when you're trying to make thresholds for images like this, it can be very difficult to pick a value that makes sense because a lot of times you'll overestimate the size of a very small object and you'll underestimate the size of a very large object. And sort of balancing this trade-off becomes very difficult but this is another area where if you have very accurate ground truth, you can use sort of this ROC approach in order to try to minimize the effects that you have from this. So by knowing exactly where that boundary should be, you can then come up with a way of picking threshold values and making choices about filters that are minimally affected by that kind of information. Um, so to now briefly start into morphology, because these things will come in to some of the exercises. Basically what this is, is this is taking, once you've done a threshold, once you've done a segmentation, to try to complete it a little bit better. And so, you know, what we mentioned first is that, you know, if you have something that's bone, you know that it's bone because it's strongly absorbing. The second kind of rule that you include with that is that you know there can't be any free-floating bone. And so if something's surrounded by bone, it's more likely to be bone itself. And if something's surrounded by air, it's less likely to be bone. And so this is where we can use these tools called morphology 
to try to group those things a little bit better. Um, and so I think Anders might have mentioned these things a little bit, so erosion and dilation. And so these are kind of the extension of those ideas. And so this happens once you've done the thresholding, because you can't really do this. It's not the same operation when you do it before. And so basically what you say is that nearby voxels in real images are related or strongly correlated with one another. So as we saw when we did this threshold rule, you didn't really look at any other voxels. You basically have a rule that you apply independently to every voxel. Morphology now gives you the ability to say, once we've applied this rule, should we make changes based on what the environment of it looks like? And how can you encapsulate that information in simple rules that you can reliably apply to data sets? The second idea, of course, that's quite important for this, also for the filtering, is that these noise and imaging artifacts are less spatially correlated. And so if you say noise is a completely random process that happens everywhere, and the image or the object in your image isn't a random process, it's very sort of grouped together, then using tools which look at your immediate neighborhood will have a better job of sort of focusing on your image and ignoring noise that comes in. And so the idea is that you have some sort of neighborhood defined for your image, and you pick kind of what is the region around your image that you expect these correlations to hold up with. And so if you're looking at things where you know, your pixel size is one micron, and you're trying to measure cells that are one micron, then your correlation distance where you expect your objects to be grouped together is you know, one pixel. You wouldn't expect it to be over multiple pixels because the object you're looking at is the same size as the pixels that you have. If you're now looking at something like, you know, a large bone, and each bone is, you know, 20, 30, 40 micrometers in diameter, then your neighborhood that you could use for operations like this would be much higher because you'd expect things to be grouped together. You wouldn't expect any single um, voxels or pixels to be separated from everything else. Um, effectively, when you pick a large neighborhood, this then lets you group things together over a larger area, but it's more computationally intensive, and it will smooth out some of the smaller features that you might be interested in. If you, yeah? So is this like a medium format, where you pick a window and basically it tries to set everything to be a single value inside of it, so there's no outliers? Or no, no? It's not, yeah, so it's not really a median filter. It's actually much stronger. So a median filter kind of replaces what's inside a window with the thing that's in the middle, which is a fairly reasonable assumption and doesn't actually affect your image that much. These operations actually affect your image a lot. So they're very highly nonlinear, which means that sort of single changes in pixels can have massive influences on the results. Um, but the idea, I guess, is the same that that larger that window is, the more area around that you're bringing in, and the more you're smoothing out or getting rid of things that you have. Um, I think, yeah. Um, so that this idea of neighborhood is actually quite important, and we'll have some examples of this in a little bit. Um, but this is some something that you want to be very familiar with becomes, because it comes in over and over and over again. And so what you define as your neighborhood is important when you do this image enhancement. It's important when you do morphological operations. It's important for later steps where you do like connected component labeling. It's important for distance map. It's important for image correlation. And so it's something that you want to be very familiar with because it's not something that's going to go away. It's really a very important thing. And it's one of the few places in image analysis where you can really put in your knowledge about the sample. You know, so if you look at a Gaussian filter, you can adjust the sigma value, but that doesn't really allow you to put in much information about what you know about the sample. When you change the neighborhood, you actually give 
sort of your image processing algorithms and approaches, information on what scale you expect things to be related or connected on. And so when you give it really, really large regions, it does very different things than you give it very small regions. And so this is the idea of the neighborhood in 2D, that you sort of have the very simple approaches where four adjacent just show up as sort of these pink pixels, eight adjacent show up as the green ones, and the center pixels there. In 3D, um, you have sort of the same idea where you now have 6, 18, and 26, and you can move well beyond that. And so you don't need to be restricted at all of those pixels at all. Um, the general idea for these is if they share a face, it's the 6 adjacent. If they share an edge, sort of on these cubes, then it becomes an 18 adjacent, and if they share a vertex, then it's a 26 adjacent. In 2D, the equivalent of that is sort of, do they share um, a face or a an edge, or do they share just a single point along them? Um, so these, you covered erosion and dilation already, right? So these things are familiar with you, but yeah. So basically erosion is where you strip a layer off, and dilation is where you add a layer back on. And so, you know, if you think about, you know, dunking a strawberry in chocolate or adding a coat of paint to a car, that's really what the effect this dilation has. And so in that sense, it's a little bit different than kind of a medium, because you are adding things onto the image or taking things away from the image at the entire image scale. And so when we see for dilation, we start off with this already segmented image, and if we apply a dilation to it, it kind of fills in all of the holes. And so if we go from an image where we might have picked a threshold that was too low, we can then use dilation to connect that together very well. And there's a lot of circumstances where you might want to pick a threshold that's very low because you don't want any noisy pixels to get in because you have a lot of noise in your system. And then you use dilation to sort of fill in all of those gaps. Alternatively, you can take a threshold value that's too high, where you have a lot of sort of stray pixels around, and then you use an erosion to get rid of all of these kind of small, noisy regions to shrink it down again. And so these tools can easily be kind of combined together based on what you're trying to exactly get out of your image. Then you have opening and closing, which is sort of a modification for this that makes it slightly less drastic, the changes that you're making. It also does a much better job at preserving the original area or volume in your images. And so typically you work much more with opening and closing than you do with erosion and dilation. So we can then apply these morphological tools to an image like this bone, where you then take it and you do a closing and you start to fill in all of the holes inside it. And so here, if you use a 3x3, three three, you then fill in, if you zoom into this image a little bit more, I'm not sure if I can do that, unfortunately not, um, you can then zoom in and see that those little blue spots are filled in, but there's still lots of regions like here and here where that is empty. If you do a 7x7, seven seven, you start to fill in some of those larger regions, um, but you still have things that are missing. And then if you do something like 45 by 45, you then fill in a lot of things that you didn't really want to fill in, but you've covered everything that's completely inside the sample. And so you sort of have a trade-off with, with this example, how big your closing size is and what fraction of your image shows up as bone. And so if you're doing an analysis where you're looking at the bone volume fraction, even though closing sort of undoes everything it does, you know, it has this erosion and this dilation in it, you're still changing that final value. And so you need to be aware that doing these steps does cause changes in this. And that particularly single noise artifacts or defects in images can be amplified when you're doing morphological operations on them. And so that's one of the things to be quite aware of, that because it isn't very strong nonlinear operation, that it can take very tiny things and turn them into very big things. <laughs>
Um, you can also use different kernels. And so you have this idea of sort of looking at vertical line, circular, diamond shape. So all of these structural elements or neighborhood definitions that you can use. Um, and yeah, so for the exercises today, one of the things um, that I think is quite interesting is a sample that was measured um, as the synchrotron of a fossil. And what um, paleontologists were able to find is they have uh, gut data and teeth data, and they were able to find sort of examples of the first animals that had teeth and the first animals that had a gut inside of it. And so it's quite an interesting data set to sort of look around and play with. And you have it in the NIME exercises that you can look at with a 3D viewer in NIME or Fiji. And you have it in the um, notebook exercises that you can look at in Kaggle or you can download as notebooks and look at yourself. And so if you look at um, the link for the course today, if you go down here, you have the Kaggle section where you have the data set, the bone segmentation test, the fossil segmentation, and then another fossil segmentation. And so if you open this, you have a Python notebook that goes through and loads the data, shows the histogram, does some filtering, kind of goes through it in all the different slice directions that you have, applies a very simple threshold, does one of these morphological operations so that you kind of you know, close a lot of the holes in it. And there you use a 3D morphological operation to do that. And then you can sort of make a 3D rendering of what that actually looks like. And you know the tasks are to go beyond that, to try to optimize that, to try to see actually what the gut was inside that they're looking at. And so if you go here and enter the password, you can actually watch the video where they talk about this documentary, which could be interesting for you to look at um, if you're curious. Um, the only other thing I would go over today would be sort of the projects and the project sign up. And so if we go down here, we have a list of possible projects and we have the ability for you to sign up. And so right now you can sign up on this sheet just to um, put down what project you're interested in and you know what you would try to show a little bit inside of that. You also have the projects from last year, the year before, and the year before as sort of a guideline to look at as you know, what other people have done and what might be interesting things to look at. You then have here the list of projects um, to go through. Obviously, the best project are data sets that you've measured yourself or that you're actually interested in evaluating. But there are other data sets that you can take from us if you're so inclined. Um, there's also quite a few Kaggle competitions where they provide you with all of the data sets and they provide you with examples of how to get started. And for those of you who don't have a project yet, there's actually a Kaggle competition that just started um, that could be interesting on cervical cancer. And so if you go competitions, Intel and mobile ODT cervical cancer screening, and if you win, I think the top prize is $100,000. And so if you're curious on testing your skills and solving an actual interesting problem, you can look at this. And what's nice is they already have sort of basic kernels which show you how to, you know, load the data and see what's inside. Oh, this isn't very good. One of them should be more interesting. not particularly good. Hopefully this one. There was one of these notebooks where they had already, yeah, started to show the data and started to say that you basically have these three different categories that you're trying to put the data in. So type one, type two, type three. 
and you need to take the images and automatically assign a category to them. And these sort of competitions are where you have the ideas with sort of the ROC curve and this accuracy, where someone has come up with a large set of ground truth data. So someone manually looked at all these images and decided which ones were type 1, type 2, type 3. And then you get a set of images where you don't know what type they are, and you have to produce the best algorithm in order to classify them into different groups. And so you then can submit on the website what classifications you have for all of their testing images and see where you show up on the leaderboard. And so, you know, a 0.7 isn't exactly this A area under the curve, but it's sort of a similar metric. And so as you adapt your approach, you potentially go up or down on this ranking list and you get sort of immediate feedback of how accurate or well your algorithm worked. And so for those of you who last week who did the um, digit recognition competition, you already saw this, that if you go over to Kaggle, Um, kernels. You can then see for introduction to contests. This was the starting point that we had where you basically try to do a very simple task of taking an image, a very low resolution small image, and classify it into a digit between 0 and 9. And what you do is you build this sort of very basic classifier you then get the results, and you can then apply that to their set of testing images where they don't tell you what digit it is. And there it's, I think, 28,000 images that you have to apply this classifier to. You then apply it. You know, it takes seven seconds because modern computers are very, very quick at this. You then save your guesses as a file, and you can go to the output and click submit to competition. And then you submit to the competition and you can see where you rank. And so when you do this, it then goes through and processes how your results match up with their internal list of classified digits. And it does not work. Well, that you can see for For this one, if you go here, you can then go to the leaderboard and see your own submissions and see how they ranked. And so, you know, the pub, the you know, introduction, if you use a very, very simple or very bad algorithm, you get you know 0.2% accuracy on your classifications. And as you try to use different approaches, it gets better and better. And so you know, here was the accuracy using the mean average error instead of the mean squared error or mean absolute error. Um, you know, 34% if you use the more complicated approaches, you know, you can use deep learning or whatever else, and you get higher and higher. But basically, it gives you sort of immediate quantitative feedback on how well your approach actually worked. And so you might have very complicated image analysis tools, but if you don't get a good result, then the whole analysis isn't really very useful. And so I would say this contest is very helpful for that because the data sets are small and it's very easy for you to check to see if it's doing something that makes sense. Whereas with larger projects, it can be more difficult than that. But um, it certainly makes a useful starting point. So are there any questions on that? Or the exercises? So if not, you can get started on that, and we'll be here to help you with any issues you run into. So.